Hello everyone, bringing you the first in a series of interviews today which I've conducted with veterans of the Falklands War as part of the content I'm putting out for the 40th anniversary of the conflict. And today it's an interview I conducted with Mick Southall who was at the time a private in 3 para, went on to retire later from the British Army as a sergeant. And without further ado we'll get into the main part of the video and listen to Mick's recollections of his experiences down south during the war. So could you talk a little bit about your having joined the army obviously just before conflict broke out yeah well i actually joined the army in 1980 right um, okay as a, as a junior as a junior at 16 and three weeks yes and um we basically did what we did then we did a year but it was such a large intake that they split us down at the end into two platoons some went to a platoon 476 that's how our platoons work you see in numbers and the rest and other people to catch up like the shooting team and the boxing team and that sort of thing they all went to what was called 477 platoon. So we actually did a year and a half basic training. I see, I see. And I joined, I joined a battalion on uh, sort of February the 27th, 28th, 1982. Yeah. We were on spearhead, so um, we did Northern Ireland training, which is ironic because I wouldn't have been allowed to Ireland, you see. We were um, 5 Infantry Brigade. The 5 Infantry at that point, and then transferred across, we yes, for the, yeah. yeah. We sailed, yeah, but about April the 9th from April Southampton, 9th. yeah, on the Canberra. And, and, yeah. and what were the preparations like leading up to that? I mean, you know, issues a new kit, any specific uh, sort of... No. No, nothing no, at all? No, just... no new kit. No, no, no. I was uh, I was a man at Q&Ms, basically. I had no new yeah. kit at all. No, no, just no, no. Not... Just basically what I'd been issued in training. And um, so um, I don't remember getting any additional equipment until we got on the Canberra, to be honest. Right, Okay. And, and what was going through, I suppose it's the, the classic question, it's what was going through your head when you were sailing sailing south? What, what was going through your mind? Well, the, the, the whole thing was just, because of my age and I suppose because of my inexperience, it was all like, you know, really, really surreal and, and like, mm. you know, dead exciting, you know, going down the, the M, down the M3, of course, towards Southampton with motorcycle escorts and all this sort of thing. You know, I was only 17. I was like, oh, man, this can't be real. I thought we'd just go around the Isle of Wight 10 times and come home, you know? Yes, yeah, we, not expecting no, nobody it, to. Thought it would. Nobody thought it would get for real. No, no, no. no. Um, it, was just, it, was, it was just really surreal the way everything sort of, it was so quick as well. Mm. That, 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 that did impress me with the speed with which we got everything ready. I mean, the camber was cruising at one minute, or sorry, one day, and then uh, what was right? What's right, we seconded on the next day, and they were building helicopter pads over the weekend. And so, yes. so quick how it, how it, um, how it transpired, how it evolved to us getting onto the ship and moving. It was, it was just so quick. Yes. Yeah. And obviously, you mentioned being issued some new kit, and obviously, training and so forth was ongoing on camera. Yeah. Whilst on the camera. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it was, um, basically, it was, it was like a self. Uh, what's the right word? Sort of self segregation between ourselves and the, the Marines. Um, they had their bars, we had our bars. Right. Okay. Um, and we just basically booked areas of the ship to carry out different training, like weapon training, first aid training, communications training, because a lot of the guys yeah. in Fleet Padder had never seen the Klansman radio. Oh, right. Okay. Interesting. Well, no, because they never had it. No. They never had it. We had to, I, I believe, we got ours from the TA. Right. Interesting. Now, yeah, yeah, I was mm. I was familiar with the radio because it's what I'd gone through training with, mm. but the battalion didn't have the radios. So, um, yeah, we had to, every, a lot of the guys had to be sort of trained on the radio and, and all that sort of stuff. We went through sort of every aspect of training you can think of, weapon yeah. handling, first aid, map reading, um, some other, you know, like really interesting lessons like conduct after capture, Geneva Convention, yeah. that sort of stuff. Of course, yeah. 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 And at, yeah. at what point, I guess... Did it sort of sink in that this is this is for real, uh, or, or rather that there's not going to be another solution to this? Where actually was it at the point that the landings were taking place, or, or did it? Well, it was, it, as soon as the Belgrana went down. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as the Belgrana went down, it was like a, a tangible change in the atmosphere. Mm. Everyone's like, right, this is for real. And then, of course, shortly afterwards, the Sheffield got hit. Yeah. And we're thinking, well, that's two large vessels gone down. There's no going back here now. There's no pulling back at all. And in terms of your sort of, did your, what were your feelings? You were saying surreal early on, obviously, as you say, that seeing this in the most, most biased sort and getting on the ship and actually heading south. When yeah. that change of feeling 
amongst the men. How, what were your feelings at that point? Were you did nerves kick in at that point, or was it? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I think I, I think everyone was nervous. I mean, some mm. people in the battalion had waited twenty years for this opportunity. Yes, I'd waited yeah. like three weeks. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So everyone was everyone was sort of what's right with everyone was sort of doing those extra checks of kit. Extra yes. checks of equipment, you know, even though they just checked it 10 minutes ago, they just went back and checked it again and just made sure that everything was, you know, in place. And, you know, yeah. this is serious now, guys. And I suppose people started taking, uh, what's the right, uh, what was it? What's the right word? I suppose people started to sort of, their, their level of, um, their level of alertness sort of heightened straight away. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. this is real. This is real now. All the talk is over. We are going to, we're going to be doing something. Yeah, yes. we're definitely going to be landing at least, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I um I landed in daylight, mm. um, which was you know not 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 the best way to do landings. As no. the air as the air raids were coming in, we were actually in landing craft. Um, the the young navy guys they couldn't get the landing craft in, so a lot of us went in up to our waist as we landed. So we were we were wet before we even got on the islands. Yeah. Um, we were just we transferred from the Canberra to the Intrepid. Yes. Um. And we were on the Intrepid for probably about a day, give or take a bit. You'll have to excuse me because some of my timings might not be absolutely spot on. No, you no, know, that's... I'm sure, you can, I'm sure you can understand that. Over, uh, over the years, we absolutely, were, yes. We were on the camber for about 24 hours. I, I remember myself, um, a couple of NCOs and a couple of other young private soldiers, we were priming an entire company's grenades just in the right. cookhouse, or sorry, in the galley. Get that yes, right, the name yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the galley, we were just priming grenades and just basically dropping them into sandbags. HT grenades just sat there doing about, we must have done a hundred of them at least, at least a hundred, at yeah. least. Yeah, and we were just doing lots of other prep on there, like prepping our weapons, etc. Uh, the Navy fed us, the Navy looked after us on Intrepid, they did what they could. It was incredibly confined, obviously. Of course, uh, yes. Just had an, extra, an extra sort of six, seven hundred guys put onto their, their boat, uh, their ship. So it was a bit cramped, but they looked after us, they fed us. And then when the um, the signal came, we all moved into different landing craft, made our ways to the made our way to the shore. But it was unfortunate because of delays that we did what was uh, was considered to be a big mistake, I suppose, is landing in daylight. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, but luckily, luckily the landing was not opposed. I, I was going to say I've, I've read comments previously that if the you know if the landings were opposed, it, it could have oh. been extreme. Well, it would have been extremely um, difficult and. <laughs> Messy. Yeah, we might not be having this, was... might not be having this conversation. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Quite so. Yeah. Quite so. Uh, and as you say, you came ashore wet, which is obviously uh, something that's often written about as well as the not. various issues with trench foot and so forth, which resulted partly from that and just partly oh, yeah. from the conditions on the ground, which is is not ideal. Yeah. So ashore wet and uncomfortable, um, and yeah. and taking up initial defensive positions at that point. Yeah, we, we took, we took, uh, yeah, up, up up on the hills around uh, San Carlos Bay. Um, we dug in there. I think we stayed there for about a week, carrying out patrols. I was in yeah. Corporal Ian Bailey's section um, in Five Platoon B Company. Uh, that's called Bailey MM. Um, and um, we just carried out patrols, um, routine in defence. Um, you know, air raids going on, air raid, air raid warning red coming up all the time. The, the, you know, the, the um, Argentine Air Force going, ignoring us and obviously attacking the ships. Yes. Yeah, it is quite a strange thing to see a capital vessel on fire. But yeah, we had a perfect view of San Carlos Bay and, and the air raid and and the battle that was going on between the the, the guys in on the ships and the obviously the Argentine pilots. Yes. To be fair, and it has been said before, the Argentine pilots were brave. Yes, yes, yeah. And then obviously in these defensive positions for time, and then move the move north, as I understand it. Yeah, to, up towards Teal. Yeah, we started walking. Um, yes. The walk, uh, I'm sure some people will be watching this and hopefully think the same as me. The walk was just horrendous. It really was. It's such a long way. And it, the, the ground is very, very similar to, to the Brecon training mm. area in South Wales there and Dartmoor, et cetera. And it, ourselves and 4-5 um, Commander broke out and we, we walked in one direction. Uh, the Marines walked in the other. And um, it was just... It was really, really, I found it really hard work. Yeah. Really hard work. And, carrying, and carrying a, a heavy load at that point as well, obviously not making I was, wings. I was probably carrying around 70, 80 pounds. Mm -hmm. But I was only 17. And it was, you know, I know it's, 
the, the age shouldn't matter, but I'm afraid it does. I was only a yes. young guy. So, you know, although I was fit, I wasn't really that strong and all the rest of it. Yeah. So that, that weight for me was a, li- a little bit, uh, probably more, um, probably more difficult for me than it would have been for a, a big, strong corporal or whatever. Yeah, you know. someone getting into his mid-20s sort of thing or, or, or yeah. Yeah, yeah, even the early absolutely. 20s. We started off all sort of, um, what's the right word? We started off all sort of, you know, everyone keeping a space and all the rest of it. And eventually everyone just said, you know, just close up, guys. You can have to get through this. And it, we lost we lost a number of guys going into the ground and, you know, up to their waist, hypothermia, you know, bad feet. And, and everyone said, oh, well, that's bad. I mean, it's not if you're out there. It just, you know, you could have been the best soldier in the world. I know some really good guys who got caught, not got caught out, but their feet just gave up on them. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, the biggest enemy we had at that stage, Simon, was the boot. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The, the DMS boot. Compressed cardboard. Just, Compressed yeah. cardboard. Absolute waste of time. If the boot's disintegrating under your feet, then it's not providing you support or anything else, is it? So. Oh, no, it, it, it just didn't. It just did not. And, um, you know, every, everyone I've spoken to has said that one of the biggest problems we had was our boots. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It was impossible to dry them out. Yes, well, of course, yeah. And as you say, the minute you set off walking again, it's one one foot in a bog, and you're you're away again, aren't you? Wet feet again. Yeah, yeah. Wet feet. So obviously, the the the, the actual the march itself very unpleasant. Um, yeah. Is what would be, I suppose, a question to ask at this point is, what is your takeaway? Do you know? Do you have sort of a aside from maybe losing people and and obviously the grief associated with that and so forth what was your what did you find the, the biggest struggle while you were there was it was it the the load and the marching itself or, or uh, on, the, your... on the march on the march it was the, the terrain it was like mm. what they call river rock rivers so right. you know it would be rivers made up of rocks and trying to get over those um no disrespect to anyone but sometimes you know with the best will in the world, some people might have got the navigation wrong, so we might have, you know, gone the wrong way and, and that sort of stuff. No criticism of anybody, because um, that's what happens in war. You know, yeah. everyone rants and raves if you get lost on black and train there, but this is war. You know, if not lost, excuse me, if people go wrong, they go wrong. We just sort it out. You know, you just sort yeah. it out. Um, but the, it was just, it was so tiring. The, the distances involved, I've heard very many different, different distances, but it's anything between 80 and 100 miles. How yeah, far we across were. across the island oh, and all, across all the, the islands. Yeah, yeah. With, obviously, there was no roads then. There is now, of course, but there was no roads then, and it was just like you said. Almost every step you were going in up to your ankles. Yeah, almost. Yeah. And then, obviously, moving across the island, you get to obviously then the battles on the mountains. Obviously, Mount Longdon in yeah. in the case of Mount three Longdon, para yeah. surrounding yeah. surrounding Stanley, and perhaps you could run us through a bit of your recollection of of that. Um, the battle itself, yeah. your experience of it. Well, we got we, we got our orders, and um, then obviously the corporals got everyone together, or the section commanders got everyone together, gave them their orders and how, how it was going to go. Um, it was about eight or ten miles from Estancia House where we were uh, established doing our admin until we actually got to Mount Longdon. You could see Mount Longdon. You could actually mm. see it in the distance. Um, we walked there. Um, there was a, a couple of, you know, quite humorous stories, the way there was, the only way to get across the Muddle River was two ladders that these two guys from Royal Engineers carried two, genuinely carried two ladders. I believe the two ladders are still at Estancia House, carried the two ladders and everyone just went across those ladders. I believe, not in my company or my opinion, I believe some people actually fell in the water and was <laughs> fought the battle soaking wet. So, you know, um, it was, that was quite difficult. Um, I was in uh, one section five between it, which was going up the centre of um, B Company's advance from uh, the start line. Up the centre or the spine of Mount Longdon to the right was six platoon and to our left was four. Um, we were on the start line. We got the command to fix bayonets, which was a little bit, you know, a bit, yeah. bit iffy or, or not. I was thinking, wow, OK, if I've got to use this, then so be it. Um <laughs> It wasn't. It wasn't the best thing. It wasn't the best order I've ever heard. But everyone just clicked them on, and that was it. Um, then we were told to advance, and unfortunately, one of our NCOs in four platoon, uh, unfortunately, trod on a mine, which alerted the Argentines. The Argentines had no idea we were there. Okay, um, and we moved. Um, as soon as that went off, then obviously they alerted the Argentinians. Okay, we was told to just run. Okay, so I did. 
got, I had the 84 at the time, which was always, it was a, was a really big bonus. Yeah. I had the 84 at the time. Yes. Um, and I just, I just legged it. And, and unfortunately I found myself in the rocks on my own. Um, I got separated just in the chaos. I just ran. And by the time I got into the rocks, okay, some other people had gone. It wasn't hard to get lost, if you know what I mean. So I got yeah. separated. Um, I went to move one way, but there were some Argentinians. Uh, they engaged the rocks. In, they, they engaged me, but hit the rocks in front of me. So I thought, I best not go that way. They look a bit busy. So I'll try the other way. So I went the other way. And, and after about five or 10 minutes, thankfully, thankfully, I met up with um, the rest of my section with Corporal Bailey. But then by that time, I'd realized that the platoon had been split up as well by a big sheet of rocks. And on the left hand side was Corporal Bailey and Corporal McLaughlin's section. And on the right hand side was Sergeant Moss and um, Corporal Eaton's section. So even our platoon was split up and we, we couldn't get back together because of the size of the feature. So they had their battle and we had our. So even then, the, the, you know, the, the platoons were broken down into subunits. The, the noise, the fighting in the, uh, like you say, the fighting is sort of such enclosed spaces. You, you could go 10 meters and you would lose contact with somebody or you, you would lose that. You certainly lose eye, eye, uh, line of sight with them. Yeah, absolutely. We, um, as I joined uh, Court Bailey and Court McLaughlin, we started moving up what is now known as Grenade Alley, where yes. it's quite a narrow gap and they were dropping grenades on us. Um, I think it's because of the, the, the um, softness of the ground that um, they, they didn't cause that much damage. Okay, and uh, uh, the first couple they dropped, they weren't taking the pins out, I've been told. So apparently somebody must have told, somebody up there must have said, uh, you forget to take the pins out, then they never forgot. And they dropped a few down. Okay, that's my recollection, of course, and, and, yes. and I've been talking about what happened. Um, but then we're moving up Mount Longdon, and um, I'm with my section, and uh, we came to this boulder, and um, I'm sort of on the left-hand side of the section, and, um, and I sort of peered around the boulder, sort of stuck my head out very, very, uh, very cautiously, and there was someone stood there. So I just sort of looked around and I just turned around to either Court Bailey or somebody, I genuinely do not remember who, and I just said, there's somebody out there. So they said, well, you can shoot him then. So I went round the rocks and I put about five or six rounds into this person. Came back round the rocks and said, they're not there anymore. So as we moved round, there they were on the ground. That, that, that's where the guy was on the ground. And um, I was like, that. wow, okay. I didn't. I genuinely thought, I didn't realise what I'd done. It was just in the heat at the moment. Training kicked in, all the rest of it. And, you know, unfortunately, I was just a little bit quicker than him. But um, somebody patted me on the back and said, well done, and all the rest of it. So, but, it, you know, I was like, that. Christ, this is serious. And, and you know, as I said, I keep going back to it, but for a 17-year-old lad to be doing that, I, I when somebody said, shoot him, I didn't even think. No. Then, then, then um, I'm just recalling my own experiences here. You know, if you speak to other people, they, they may say, oh, well, we did it. Um, we moved along there, and that's when um, we we seen these bunkers. Um, and Cottle Bailey said, you know, who's got the 84? So I did. So he said, right, well, get him up here. So I sort of stumbled up with this bloody thing. And he was like that. There, bunkers, hit him. So, right, OK. And Boots Meredith was the, was the number two, if I remember rightly. He loaded it. Um, I did shout standby, but unfortunately, um, Taff Ed was one of our Section 2 ICs, was actually behind the 84 when I fired ah. it. And um, I still talk to Taff now, and he took his head off. <laughs> um, so I fired the 84. It did hit the bunker. A, a, lot of, a lot of people might say it, but it did hit the bunker. And then I was told to reload and fire at another one. So I went to reload. and Oh, sorry. I reloaded, and I went to fire, and it clicked. So I was like, ah, right, misfire. And I thought, right, what you're supposed to do in peacetime, of course, what you're supposed to do is sit there for a minute. Of course, not a good idea in no. battle to sit. So unfortunately, they started to engage us. And I remember somebody sort of kicking me or dragging me out of the way, going, what are you doing, you idiot? You can't stay out there. And I, okay, so I sort of hit the floor with this 84 or like helmet all over the place. Like, you idiot, because all the rounds were sort of hitting the rocks around us. And uh if someone said, oh, I said, what should I do with it? And I said, just throw it away. So I literally threw an 84 away with a heat round in it. Live, potentially. Yeah. Just... And um, I believe Craig, a, a good friend of mine, Craig Harry Harrison said, funny enough, I was the other side of the rocks and I could hear you, Block. He said, I could hear you counting standby. 
He said, that's all you well, that was me. Uh, then a, a couple of guys went forward and cleared the bunkers. I didn't. A couple of guys went forward and cleared the bunkers. Yeah. Quite, quite a harrowing, but at the same time, I suppose in hindsight, yeah. as you're saying, there's amusement in the fact that at the, time, the difference between... Yeah. At the time, your training kicks in. Yeah. And that's why training is so important. Sorry to, sorry to sound that way, but it's true. Mm. Training is so important because it should kick in, and it did. And, and all, all I recall now, okay, I never gave it a single thought at the time. Just straight into like an automaton, straight into it. Yes. Rather than thinking, oh, what about this? What about that? And my main motivation, as I was talking to somebody last night, actually, about this, my main motivation, I didn't want to let anyone down. Mm. I certainly didn't want to let my regiment down, and I certainly didn't want to let anyone down. You know, so that, that was one of my main motivations, was, was not to, you know, to put on a, what's the right word? Put on a, a good display, should we say? Yes, yeah. Yeah, and not let, yeah. Not let my mates down, or, or my, my corporals and all that down. And, and so camaraderie that comes into that, to a degree, as, as well. Uh, camaraderie as comes into it again. I don't think, I don't think, well, very, very few people fight for Queen and Country. I think they fight for the, the guys at the next team. Mm. I, I genuinely believe that. Some people go, oh, that's not right. Well, I genuinely believe that. Yeah. Well, from someone who's yeah. been there and, and in that situation, and that's what you recollect fighting for at the time, then that's your experience, yeah. isn't it? You know, that's Absolutely, the, yeah, yeah. I can't argue Absolutely. with that in your instance. And, yeah. and both, both 6 platoon, I've got really good friends in 6 platoon and 4 platoon, we're both having it really, really hard. Really, really bad. Yeah. You know, we weren't the only ones that were coming up against enemy positions or enemy soldiers that, you know, were resolute to say the least in their defence of London. And this is something yeah. I think has been a, a, a little bit mischaracterised over the years, is there has been a, in some instances, people have, have said, oh, you know, the Argentine conscripts, they didn't put up any resistance, so, you know, it was, <laughs> which, you know... <laughs> I've read other, other that's, accounts, that's why, obviously you're saying now that certainly wasn't the yeah. case in certain instances. That, that, that's, um, why, that's, why my co- that's why my company lost nearly 67% casualties because no one put yeah. up a fight. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, crazy. I, love, I, I, do love it when, I do love it when people say that. Yeah, so how yeah. come my company was down to about 30 blokes then? <laughs> yeah. it, it, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't make any sense. Well, as you say, look, purely looking at the figures, but also just, as you say, from other people's account, it doesn't make any sense. I don't know why that's sort of become a... I think it's because of... Uh, potentially the the characterization of demoralized conscripts and therefore people just assume or some people have taken that yeah. as you know as, as the you know a, a, a description of their fighting ability which that which obviously it wasn't in certainly not in all instances so i think the best yeah. way for, the best way i've always i've always summed it up for myself is they were as patriotic and as keen on or on their cause as we were on mm. ours yeah they firmly believed that they were fighting for the right thing and so do we. Yeah. Okay. Um, that that's the way I've always sort of rationalised it for myself. The young guy, they they didn't run off. I'm sure some did, but, um, but a lot of them didn't. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So a tough a tough fight, obviously. Um, well, it, for, it, it took us mountain. at least twelve. It took us nearly eighteen hours to take the mountain. I believe. Yeah. So that, that's that's a long old battle. I know there's been longer battles since in places like Afghanistan, etc. <laughs> 18 hours at night, you know, on up that mountain, it was still quite hard, quite a, a feat to achieve, but also quite a difficult thing to do. Yes. But and I am assuming, to... I'm assuming most people watching this are at least somewhat familiar with the, the Battle of Mount Longer, but obviously to point out it was a night attack as well, which is. Um... Oh, yeah, it was night, with no, with no, um, no night viewing aids. No. No, no, we didn't have, we didn't have um, PNGs. PNGs were around, but they weren't issued to us. The, the no. Argentinians had them. But um, we certainly didn't. No. So it was just a case of, you know, everyone being a link man, shouting everything down, etc. Yes. Yeah. And sort of firing at muzzle flashes and so forth when you when you saw them. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And hope, hoping they were the enemies. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's In the confusion, which you Yeah. A little bit chaotic. And yeah. well, the confusion you've already, and the chaos you've already already sort of described there. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the, 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 there's there's lots of um. I mean, I don't know how long you've got. There's lots of things that people, lots. who unless unless they unless they read a James O'Connell's book, there's a lot of things that people don't realise, like about Sergeant Mackay's attack, about the casualties, the mm. the, the aid post, the casualty evacuation, um, you know, and just just how bad. Um, the actual battle was it was an extremely brutal battle i i would be very interested to hear and i've certainly got time to listen so please it really was i mean ian, ian mckay's assault um 
went forward, a recce patrol, or what was supposed to be an, a recce patrol, turned into an attack with Cortal Bailey, as I said, my section commander, who, who received the MM for his actions. Sergeant Mackay received the Victoria Cross. Okay. Um, and it, it, again, it's, it's written down in places. John Lewis, called John Lewis, just reached out in the dark and grabbed the first hand that was next to him. And it just happened to be me, because by this time, four and five platoon had actually joined up to make a unit. Because the, uh, four platoon were also um, separated from, like, to, couldn't establish it as one unit. We joined up together to make one bigger unit. So Corporal John Lewis was actually four platoon. He grabbed me. We went round with a, an, another gentleman who's now a Colonel, Sully Alagi. And we went round and we found Corporal Bailey. Um, um, Corporal Lewis or John Lewis told um, Sully Alagi to treat Corporal Bailey. So Sully stayed with him and treated him. Uh, he had, he'd been shot three times, once in the hand, once in the hip and once in the neck. So Sully did a great job there. I, myself, and um, sorry, Corporal Lewis then dragged, not dragged me, but then took me with him and we found Sergeant Mackay on the position. Corporal Lewis confirmed he was dead. Now, Sergeant Mackay was actually my platoon sergeant in depot. He was the guy who passed me out the depot. So yeah, strong so feelings, was, uh, strong feelings at that uh, point. Oh yeah, I was, I felt awful. I couldn't believe the guy was dead, to be honest. Yeah. He was such a good guy in the depot. He really was. Um, so Corporal Lewis confirmed that. The Argentines, Argentines then seen me and Corporal Lewis and they started to engage us. So we moved back round. Uh, we picked up Sully Elijah and picked up Corporal Bailey. And it was then that the order came from company headquarters via the awesome Sergeant Major Johnny Weeks. I'm sure you've heard that name before. He said, right, get the casualties together. Um, and Corporal McLaughlin was also there. Corporal McLaughlin was giving orders all night. You know, I'm sure you've heard that name before. Giving orders all night, leading assaults, um, doing everything. You know, I mean, literally everything for, for our sort of our, our group of guys. Um, some people were closer to him than I was, but I could. I was forever hearing his voice, keeping people going forward. Just don't want to lose the momentum. Um, but then there was a, a lot in the battle where we were allowed to get our casualties back, uh, and that's when we realised, or sorry, myself and my sort of young, uh, sorry, small group of younger soldiers realised how bad it had gone for us because we'd actually lost three of our friends. Um, one had been killed in, I believe, in one of the initial births, Private Bert. Private Scrivens had been treated, um, been treating another Private Gross. Um, and while he was treating him, he got shot. Um, one of the other 17, it might have turned 18 by then, Mark Latter, excuse me. Mark Carl Thomas was there. He's seen all this. We went out and I ended up next to, or near Mark Carl Thomas, um, on a stretcher with him, trying to get Neil back to the regiment laid post. Uh, Neil had been um, hit in the chest and was um, in an awful, awful lot of pain, an awful lot of trouble. Um, we were all trying to reassure him. Um, obviously, he wasn't the only casualty, but it was a casualty that I dealt with. Um, we got him back to the regiment laid post where um, Phil Probert was was under an awful lot of pressure because the casualties were... I, nobody realised, I don't think, how many there actually were until we started getting them back. And, and concentrating them in one place, yeah. Oh, and it was concentrating in one place. Um, and Neil was in, in an awful lot of pain, so Mark didn't want to leave him. I didn't want to leave him. So I stood at his feet while Mark sort of um, comforted him at his head and, and spoke to him. And that's where the young lad died, unfortunately. It was his 18th birthday. Yeah, really yeah. had a win. So yeah, that stuff. was that was it's just yeah. That was that was really that has affected me ever since. I, I won't lie. Yeah, it has. That was the worst thing of the uh, the night. Yeah. yeah. Um. I, after that, um, we then we regrouped, reorganised, and the uh, company commander decided we were just going to take make one more push along what's commonly known now as the sheep track, and um. That's where we moved down. Um, whatever was left of the company, basically, it was just a mixture of everybody. There's, there was people from other companies as well, from support company and from uh, the signals platoon, etc. cetera. Um, it was just a, whatever it was. It was a gang of guys, and we're just going to keep going forward. And that's when we got, for want of a better phrase, an ambush front where two guys just ran out, fired automatic bursts of what I'm assuming would be FN 7.62, straight down the line. They hit loads of people, including killing one guy, and that was John Crow. Killed him instantly. Um, we got back from that position, 
uh, or, or back from that location, Cuttle, uh, McLaughlin fired a 66, which allowed people to move. He knelt up, fired a 66, straight into a bunker, which is I want, which is an, a feat in itself to hit anything with a 66. <laughs> he fired it into the bunker, um, and we then started we then started to evacuate those casualties back into what is called the first, what's known now on the mountain as the first bowl, and and that's where. B Company sort of regrouped what was left of us. It was about, I think it was about 25, 30 of us, something like that. You know, um, I'm not entirely accurate with the figures. And, and we were in the bowl there sort of trying to administrate ourselves, redistribute ammunition, do the classic British soldier thing, get a brew on. Um, while we were told that A Company would then push through and take the remaining sort of kilometre or the kilometres. It's a very long feature. It's about three or four kilometres long. And A Company pushed through us, actually taking our ammunition off us because B Company were just basically, you know. And I, I do remember one um, very, very good friend of mine called Ned Cameron came through and, and he was told to get the ammunition from B Company. And he just said to Sergeant Major Weeks, where's the rest of the company? He said, cut Cameron, this is it. Or something along those lines. And, and, and uh, Ned Cameron, like I say, a very, very good friend of mine, he sort of went, right, OK. Looked a little bit shocked himself. To be honest, you know, really shocked that this was what was left. Yeah, it was, uh, and that was B Company's sort of uh, role, not finished, but that was where we were taken over from A Company. Yes, they, they took over from us. Should I say? Excuse me. Yeah, they took over from they took over from us because we were basically not a spent force by any stretch of the imagination, but we were, you know, we we took a hammer in. To be honest, hmm. and at the very least, very least needed time to, as you say. <laughs> Um, get and out of order and everything else. Yeah. And we organise ourselves. We had mm. private soldiers promoted in the field from private to Lance Corporal to become section commanders. We only had one NCO left. <laughs> we had, and that was Colin Edwards. And I nearly done him with the 84, bless him. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I know how silly. But um, yeah, he was the only NCO left. Yeah. All the others have been either killed or injured. Or injured. Very, uh, very sobering stuff. Very, very sobering yeah. stuff. Um, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Sad, sad, sad times, proud times, but sad as well. Yeah. Well, thank you for, thank you for recounting that. I've obviously a difficult, perhaps a difficult thing to, to yeah, run Rose over again. Dead. Really did hit me hard. Yeah. It yeah. really did. I'm not going to lie. It did. Still does now. Mm. Yeah. Unsurprisingly. I, I, there's yeah. nothing in my experience that I can compare to that on any level at all. So I, I don't know. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. We, we tried all we could. We really did. We tried everything. Yeah. We, we Mark, Mark, myself, and other people, there were other people there as well. So Steve Jelf was only 17. I was only 17. I think Mark was still under 18. I'm sure he'll correct me on that. Even he was under 18. It was everyone getting on the stretcher, trying to get him up, move him as quick as we could. And unfortunately, the injuries that he sustained were just, just so, you know, so yeah. uh, serious well, that he just couldn't survive. A mortal wound, yeah. And yeah. at this stage, obviously, as you say, you, you're getting reorganised and you're in this yeah. this position now. How yeah. did things progress from there? Um, from there, a, a company moved through us. Um, yes. And, and a, you, you're probably best talking to somebody from A Company about that. About I, that I, I wouldn't, next stage I wouldn't speak it. with any great authority on what A Company did, but I know they went through um, went through us and carried on taking the remainder of the mountain. Um. So uh, the best people to speak to, that will be hopefully some of, from A Company. Of course. Uh, for us as B Company, um, what happened then is the artillery started. For, well, for everybody, not just for us, of mm, course. Yes. The artillery started for everybody. And um, the Argentines, I believe, had three 155 guns or 105. They had uh, three guns lined up on long, and they just basically did a creeping barrage over and back for around 36 hours, something like that. And they they um they actually unfortunately they injured um Court McLaughlin, um who was unfortunately sorry Court McLaughlin was injured by uh, a, an attack by a, a missile, I believe a Stinger missile. I may well be wrong on that, uh, which also injured a very good friend of mine called Grant Grinham, um and Andy Steadman, another good another good friend of mine. He got injured in the back, and Court McLaughlin had quite a bad gap in his job, but he just wouldn't he wouldn't go to the RAP. No, we had to be ordered. No, you will go. And he said, no, no, I'll be all right. And people, not not me, of course, but some people, well, no, you've got to go. And 
unfortunately, on the way down, he um, actually got taken out by the Argentine artillery and killed. Yeah, and uh, for, for for what he for what he did that night, and this is not to um, this is not to diminish the efforts of anybody else. I, I I believe he should have got awarded something, which is an ongoing an ongoing thing. I know, but um, in my view, he definitely should have been awarded something for his actions. You know, during the battle, we just like just kept everyone going. Yeah. You know, he was, he was that he was that one guy you wanted. To, you know, every unit's got one. Every yeah, you know, I'm sure they have. That that guy you will follow anywhere. And he and he was he was that guy that kept everyone going. Yeah. From what he was doing yeah. and and the the. It, it, it wouldn't be little any other medal. At all. It wouldn't be. Yeah, it wouldn't he be little any something. other medal. Mm. He should have got something. It wouldn't be little any medal that was awarded. No, I'm not for one minute suggesting anybody got awarded something they shouldn't have. That's no, for no, other no. people. To do. But uh, in my view, Scott McLaughlin should have got something. Mm. We we stayed on the mountain for about, um, like I say, for about 36 hours, and then we were told um, a B company were. Uh, so I think we were in reserve again. Somebody with more tactical now than I had at 17. One them. I think we were in the reserve. I was. I was bombed up like something out of a film to walk into Port Stanley. I had an SLR, I had an SMG on my back. I had grenades in every pouch you can think of because we thought we were going to fight for Stanley. Okay, and on the way down, we sort of um, got told to wait, you know, and then all of a sudden they're saying, oh, there's, uh, the message got down, there's white flags over Stanley, that sort of thing. So, and then we were told to put our berries on and um that might have been on the road. We were told to put our berries on. And uh, we sort of noticed that sort of two and three paddock were sort of getting closer and closer to Stanley together. <laughs> and I sort of said, oh, can you go firm? And <laughs> no. So basically, it was just a race. Mm. Okay. And I'll, I'll leave it to the historians to decide um, who got there. I know I didn't. But uh, no. you know, it, it, it was definitely, as long as I'm not really bothered, as long as it was a maroon berry that was into Stanley first, I'm not really bothered. Yeah. Yeah, didn't uh, didn't bother me as long as it was two or three paddle, and yeah, first to land, first into battle, two paddle, two battles, three paddle, and then first into Stanley. So I was quite happy with what we achieved. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And what were your experiences on moving into Stanley? I mean, what did you find? What what was your we, you know? I presume there was a few. Did... Yeah, there was a few um, casualties on the way. Not from us. Mm. There was a few bodies from injured some injured Argentine soldiers, which our medics treated. Okay, they treated them, um, even Kazivak them, etc. You know, young as you said, they're only young guys. They're on the side of the road, injured. Maybe their colleagues left them, or maybe they got injured. It doesn't matter. Our guys treated them. We moved into Port Stanley. We started to occupy houses. Mm -hmm. Basically, we were told to go into people's houses. Um, B Company went into a house. There wasn't enough room in there, so about four of us went into a garage. Okay, which probably something thinking, oh God, it must have been cold in there. Well, actually, it worked out really well because we had loads of room. <laughs> so we <laughs> sort of fed up. So it actually worked out in favour for us. Um, myself was in there with another 17 year old, another really, really good guy called Steve Jelf. I've already mentioned him. And a guy called Ron Duffy. And one other, I can't remember who it was. And we were in the garage and we were just like administering ourselves. They came, you know, things happened like people came along with fresh food and rations and all that sort of stuff, chance to dry our socks out, chance to get a hot meal and a brew. Um, we, we, uh, you know, we administrated ourselves. There was like a, um, for want of a better phrase, a sort of no man's land between the Argentinians and the British, which I believe was patrolled by both Argentinian and UK military police. Okay. Um, or perhaps a Navy Provo, something like that. Um, and eventually, uh, I believe the surrender was signed on the 15th or 16th of June with uh, General Moore there, Brigadier Thompson, and, uh, and obviously General Menendez signing the surrender. And, and, and basically that was it. And that's when, you know, we started like collecting all the Argentines' kit, you know, um, shipping them off. They, they were sent, they were taken on a, I believe it was a Canberra to the Monte, to Montevideo in Uruguay, yeah. handed over to the, the Red Cross there and, and all repatriated. Um, we, we had the unpleasant task of uh, going back up to London Maybe once or twice. I remember going up at least twice just to, um, you know, clear the area as best we could, you know, of any personal equipment, stuff like that. Um, we went up there a couple of times. Um, we, we stayed in the, we stayed in the um, garage. It was given us a chance. We had a couple of cans of beer. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, even though I wasn't old enough to drink, as somebody pointed out, <laughs> you're just a drink that. Just a, an insane it. thing, really. But yes, I think you might have earned it. But yeah, uh, yeah. absolutely. Um, but yeah, that was good. I, I, I like to. I, I try to have a look at it with a bit of humour. And someone said, mm. "You're old enough to drink that." <laughs> yeah, I am actually. I'll get off. Um, you send a telegram home. Um, get our mail forwarded to us. All that sort of stuff, and get prepared for us to make our way back to the UK. Yeah. All those sort of, you know. Probably we probably did an awful lot of administration with paperwork, handing in ammunition, course, making declarations yeah. that we've got no live rounds or empty cases, believe it or not. That sort of stuff. All has to be done. Yeah. All or not has to be done. So all that sort of administration was carried out. And we also held a, a church service in Stanley Cathedral, uh, which I believe was attended by well, two para uh, I think two para were there as well. So two and three para held one, and then I believe four, two. Um, four or five commander they also held a, a church service maybe the day after or something like that it wasn't any there wasn't there's no segregation it was just easy to say right you know you guys have it one day and we'll have it the next yeah um so uh yeah it was it was just like sorting stuff out and the one thing i found amazing is just how port stanley just looks like uh, it's completely different now of course but at the time it just looked so small and mm. really weird you mentioned before could you see port stanley from um, for Mount London, yeah, you could. And the weird thing was, you could see it at night. So we're on London, right. yeah, getting artillery, waiting for two para to attack Wireless Ridge. Remember, two para went into battle twice, yes. waiting, waiting for two para to go into Wireless Ridge, and we could see Port Stanley lights flick, vehicles moving, and we're, you know, two para are just about to go in for an assault, and, and we're watching vehicles moving. You know, it's just really, really weird. I didn't Very see surreal. two para an assault going. I didn't mm. see two paddles of salt go in. I only heard it. Mm. I only heard it. Yeah. And what yeah. was your experience on, you know, what did you think when you returned home? What was the feeling like? Because I've, I've heard some well, people say it was very odd getting back to the UK oh, it, after. It was, it, it was very odd. Um, quite rightly, the, the army's moved on a little bit f from this kind of thing. But we, we were just basically sent home. Yeah. Just... You know, we didn't. Need, I don't remember even handing weapons in. I think we had them in bundles on the coach, and we just threw the bundles into the armory, and then right off you go. So I went to my room, opened my box, I boxed up in case the worst happened, got what any clothing I had, and um, went to get. Um, there were, believe it or not, there was a train strike on, so we couldn't get home. <laughs> of course, early eighties. So yes, yeah. Yes, so we were given we were given bus tickets, but by the time we'd got to Tidworth, we'd missed the last bus. And uh, one of the guys I shared a trench with in, in the Falklands, Gaz Lloyd or Scouse Lloyd, as I knew him, his parents came to pick us up, uh, came to pick him up. And he said, you know, oh, where are you going? Oh, Chester. He goes, oh, I'll drop you off on the way. Um, the sad part is the vehicle broke down <laughs> about three or four miles out of Tidworth. It was a, I'm sure it was a marina. He, he'll, he'll be able to tell me off for that. I'm sure it was an arena, a marina. And the... Uh, AA guy came along and we never had, or sorry, Scouse's mum and dad never had um, the sort of relay cover, that sort of stuff. And um, his, and his mum just went, well, these two guys just come back from the Falklands. And the bloke was like, that. right, I'll sort it out. And they, they actually drove us all the way to, uh, they dropped us off, they dropped me off just outside Chester, a, a, a big set of traffic lights outside Chester. And I just walked into the nearest pub and got a taxi home from there. Yeah. But it was just really weird that we, we got... We changed vehicles at Birmingham. Just that kind of stuff. We, we, had, a, we had a lot of stuff. Like the, the taxi driver who took me from the pub home, and um, there was a big party outside. And he said, oh, what's that all about? So I just come back from the Falklands. He said, oh, not paying you for the taxi. Don't pay for the taxi then. Yeah. Yeah. We did actually go round once because we pulled up at first, and I just went, go past. So I didn't want it. I didn't want it, to be honest. I couldn't be bothered with it because I, I thought at the time, Okay, it might, it might be great, but I, I didn't see anything to celebrate. Mm. So I said to this taxi driver, you keep going. And then um, we went to our local pub and he just said, right, okay, do you want a drink? I had a drink. And um, I said, right, you can take us back there now. So I just needed a little bit of, um, you know, just just take a deep breath here because then everyone's going to be going, oh, well, well done and all the rest of it. Yeah. And I'm thinking, there are families of people that I know whose sons aren't coming home. So I just didn't feel like celebrating at the time. No, I just but quite it. understandably, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was, it was a bit surreal, and and everyone was nice here for a few months. You know, it's it's too, <laughs> it's too debated, but people, yes. people were nice here for a few months. Yeah, yeah. 
and I believe what you said, obviously you stayed in the army at that point. I did, yeah. And, I, and I could you just sort of, years. perhaps as a, clo- you know, almost a closing thing, you'd tell us a li- just in brief a little bit about your career in the army from that point. Yeah, I, um, I, I left B Company, I went to the anti-tank, spent a few years in there, went to, uh, got, got promoted to Lance Corporal, went back to a rifle company, um, did all my courses, got promoted to sergeant, um, was a, a, a local colour sergeant at somewhere called Purbright, um, and I was just about to leave the army when um, I got a phone call telling me that um, I could go on to the, what's called the long service list. So um, I was just about to get out, and um, a, a Major Bryant rang me and said, oh, are you um, Colour Sergeant Southford? I said, well, I'm not a Colour Sergeant. I'm just, I'm only, while I'm in this job. He went, well, we're looking for s- someone to do a training wing in Holland. And I obviously thought it was a wind-up, so I put the phone down and I went, yeah, piss off. Put the phone down. And then he rang me back. He said, I'm telling you now, do you want this job or not? I went, yeah, go on then. <laughs> so I, I ended up doing another six years. About Yeah, so I, I, I got out in uh, 2008. And I, I know people will say, and this is quite, it's quite funny, people say, ah, yeah, but anything under 18 doesn't count. Mm, maybe not the person you should say that to. No. <laughs> yeah, under 18 doesn't count. What a bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, no, no, I, I left. I left in 2008. Yeah, since then I've done a, a number of jobs, to be honest. And now mm-hmm. I just teach first aid. I work part-time, just teach first aid. Yeah. And I'm so, going to say, yeah, yeah I, a, a nice thing to come to in that regard at the end of it all is, is very much the, you know, helping you know initial treatment of people and stuff it must be that's a satisfying thing to have, it, it, have it, it was one of the, when i was in the military it's one of the things that i never ever avoided was any first aid course i mm. could do yeah i did as much as i could do all you know all your team medics your company medics your you know rma3 and i never did any more but you know what i mean all that sort of stuff mm. anything i could do i did yeah anything i could yeah. do i did so there we are i want to say a big thank you again to mick for taking the time to sit down and recall some of these experiences that he had down south during the war and obviously some of the details there of his subsequent career in the army as well. It was very much appreciated Mick, thank you very much for sitting down and taking the time, it's greatly appreciated. Obviously there will be more of these interviews coming up going forward and if you'd like to see those please do consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already and whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed please do make sure you hit the little bell with the notification button down below, that will of course alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below in the video description. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And as ever, if you would like to get in touch with me but you don't really use social media, there is of course an email address down in the description as well. That's everything for this video, so until next time, bye for now.